Legal Conference presented to you by the U.S. Air Force Academy's Law, Technology, and Warfare Research Cell, together with the U.S. Space Command Office of the Staff Judge Advocate. This conference has really been two years in the making as we originally planned to hold an in-person conference here at the Academy in 2020. But as was so much recently, we had to flex. Nevertheless, we are extremely excited to finally welcome you. My name is Professor Jeff Biller, and along with Lieutenant Colonel Tim Goins, Lieutenant Commander Mark Rasmussen, and Major Jeremy Grunet, we are your conference hosts. If you have any questions or concerns during the conference or after, please contact us through the chat or via our email, ltwrc at usafa.edu. You can find the address in the chat. One other note before we begin, all opinions and thoughts expressed as part of this conference should be considered the personal opinions of the speakers unless otherwise indicated. Now, I would like to introduce Brigadier General Nell Latendra and Colonel Darren Huskison, who will provide some opening comments. Brigadier General Linnell A. Latendra is the Dean of the Faculty, U.S. Air Force Academy. She commands the 750 member Dean of Faculty Mission Element and oversees the instruction of more than 500 undergraduate courses for 4,000 cadets across 32 academic disciplines. Brigadier General Latendra graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1996 as a distinguished graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree in Astronautical Engineering. After serving as an acquisition officer, she became a judge advocate through the funded legal education program. After several distinguished tours as a judge advocate, she served as the permanent professor and head of the Air Force Academy's Department of Law prior to becoming the Dean of Faculty. Colonel Huskison is the staff judge advocate for the United States Space Command. As the US SpaceCom SJA, he serves as the principal legal advisor to the commander, staff, and component commands in the execution of the command's mission to conduct operations in, from, and through space to deter conflict, defeat aggression, deliver space combat power for the joint and combined force, and defend U.S. vital interests with allies and partners. Colonel Huskison enlisted in the Air Force in January 1986 and has served as a judge advocate since 1996, previously serving as the staff judge advocate for the Air Force's Cyber and U.S. Strategic Command. General Latendra, I now turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much. What, a, what an honor uh, to be kicking off uh, this incredibly important conference. And on behalf of the Air Force Academy and the Law, Technology, and Warfare Research Cell, um, we are so pleased to be able to partner with U.S. Space Command uh, to bring this uh, to all of you. Uh, you know, this this conference really represents two of my passions, uh, law and space. Um, as was mentioned, I was an astronautical engineering major here at the Academy, and I, I long remember the days of uh, mastering orbital mechanics and, and learning about the important role that they play in our, in, in our national security. I, I will tell you that many of the possibilities we explored in those classes have now become real. Right, personal conveniences like uh, GPS uh, that you that you walk around in your pocket with, um, to you know the efficient execution of emergency services, uh, to to all the accounting in our uh, financial markets, uh, we all realize and recognize um, that without space and without space technologies, our modern activities would not be possible. But as attorneys. We know that these possibilities have developed new questions with which we must wrestle. Uh, chief among them are the legal aspects of space operations, uh, the very topics that, these, that this conference is going to explore. And, and these issues aren't easy. Um, over 15 years ago, I helped to co-teach the space law and policy course uh, here at the Academy with a professor of a Department of Political Science. And at that time, we talked about generalizations about the commercialization and military uses of the space domain. Today in our classrooms, we openly wrestle with issues about orbital warfare and about how to identify hostile intent in space. And over the next two and a half days, you're going to hear from experts and practitioners in a variety of fields and discuss topics ranging from space acquisitions, contracting, interagency coordination, essential partnerships between DOD and commercial enterprises, as well as our international partnerships around the globe. Importantly, you'll also wrestle with the limits and constraints of international space law on uh, military operations here. 
But before we uh, launch into the conference, uh, and yes, that was an intentional pun, I'd like to share with you what we've been doing here at the Air Force Academy to ensure that we are developing space-minded officers who will graduate as second lieutenants for both our Air Force and our Space Force. Because I will tell you that both services absolutely require space-minded officers. Let's start first with our curriculum. The Academy requires an introduction to astronautics, uh, to astronautical engineering course. Uh, it's part of our core curriculum. And so every single graduate actually understands uh, orbital mechanics. For those with a deeper interest, uh, they can major in astronautical engineering, um, as well as our space operations major, which trades some of the higher end uh, math and engineering courses for some more interdisciplinary work in law or policy, history or military strategic sciences, um, and really looks and focuses on how, how we actually execute space effects in the joint warfighting domain. We've also just added a new data science major to help prepare our officers for the big data that is prevalent in all of our space operations. And we also started a space warfighting minor, which is importantly open to all academic majors. So whether you're a history major or a physics major, you can add a space warfighting uh, minor on to, to expand your understanding of issues surrounding space operations. And we're really excited, uh, especially because of the interdisciplinary nature of that academic minor. At an individual course level, we enhance our cadets' understanding of critical space issues uh, with a course that is near and dear to my heart, uh, which is Law 419, or Space Law. It was first offered last spring um, in a special partnership uh, with US Space Command um, as a standalone course um, full of international, national, and military operations space law. I'm excited to share with you today uh, that Major Grunet, uh, Jeremy, is uh, this semester's uh, space law instructor, and he's actually assigned his students to come to this conference um, when their courses allow, and they're going to be in absorbing just an amazing amount of information um, from this, from the panels and speakers here today. And to all you cadets listening out there, I challenge you to ask our speakers and panels your absolutely toughest questions uh, and get them answered um, and then bring them back to our classrooms um, and as well as, uh, as to your fellow cadets. On top of our space-oriented curriculum, we also have a number of extracurricular activities and research institutes uh, that are dedicated um, to looking at space. We have a Center for Space Situational Awareness Research. We have a Space Systems Research Center, the Space Physics and Atmospheric Science Research Center, a Space Operations Center, um, an Eisenhower Space Policy Center, as well as our newly formed Institute for Future Conflict that provide cadets a wealth of opportunities to go outside the classroom and to take on hands-on experiential learning through a variety of research efforts. As a matter of fact, um, this last summer, our Institute for Future Conflict actually sponsored a week-long seminar on looking at future conflict issues specifically with respect to space control. We partnered with MITRE Corporation on that, and it was just an incredible opportunity for our cadets to learn more about the space domain. We actually have our first Space Force uh, IDE, or Intermediate Developmental Education Fellow, um, who the Space Force lent us, uh, who is teaching and researching as a member of the faculty, and will go back to the Space Force armed with um, his research and exploration about how we develop future Space Force operators. Uh, I will tell you, I could go on and on uh, with all the things that the Air Force Academy is doing. Um, as we like to say here, we are this place for space. Uh, and so with that, I, I'm, all, I'm very excited to be able to share and extend uh, a warm welcome now to a friend and colleague uh, for, for many, many years um, who has uh, taken on uh, the, the, uh, the, the co-hosting co of, of this particular conference, uh, Colonel Darren Huskinson. Over to you, Darren.
Thank you, General Latendre. Uh, good morning from everyone from Colorado Springs. Welcome to our first ever legal conference. I want to give a special thanks to our co-sponsors at the United States Air Force Academy. Uh, the Department of Law at the Air Force Academy, they really did the heavy lifting for this endeavor, both in terms of logistics and substance. Uh, we hope this partnership with the Academy is the beginning of an enduring relationship and is indicative of great things to come. Partnerships are extremely important to us and the partnership with academia really is critical. As we start this conference, I want to share with you the two questions I'm always asking. Are we addressing the legal issues of the future and how do we do it faster? Uh, we need to start addressing those issues we're going to face in the coming decade right now and we need to do it fast. Commanders and space operators want to go fast. How do we keep up and how does the law keep up? Some are predicting a disruptive change in the practice of law over the course of the next decade. And we in the space law community will likely be afforded no choice but to embrace that change and make our legal operations faster and leaner. As I continue to seek the answers to my questions, I'm certain this incredibly experienced and diverse collection of ex experts we have this week will not disappoint. So with that, I thank you all for your attendance and participation, and I look forward to an excellent conference. Thank you, General Latender and Colonel Huskisson. Now I'd like to introduce the commander of U.S. Space Command, General James Dickinson, who will provide the conference welcoming remarks. General James H. Dickinson assumed duties as the commander U.S. Space Command on 20 August 2020, after most recently serving as the first deputy commander of U.S. Space Command, the 11th and most recently established Unified Combatant Command. General Dickinson is a native of Estes Park, Colorado, and a graduate of Colorado State University. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a Master of Science in Operations Research and Systems Analysis from the Colorado School of Mines. He later earned a Master's Degree in Strategic Studies from the United States Army War College. General Dickinson has previously served as the Chief of Staff U.S. Strategic Command, Commanding General of the Space and Missile Defense Command, Army Forces Strategic Command, and Joint Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense. Commanding General of the 32nd Army Air and Missile Defense Command, Commanding General of the 94th Army Air and Missile Defense Command. General Dickinson, the floor is yours. Hey, well, thank you and, and good morning. And welcome to U.S. Space Command's inaugural law conference. Thank you to the Air Force Academy, Law, Technology, and Warfare Research Cell and U.S. Space Command Staff Judge Advocate Office for co-hosting this very important event today and for the next two and a half days is what I think I heard. Hey, and just before I start, I'll just have to say to all the Air Force Falcons in the room, you know, you heard in my bio that I'm a Colorado State Ram at heart. Uh, you know, you're, you're probably pretty lucky that we didn't get an opportunity to play you this last season in football, but uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that this upcoming season is going to be pretty challenging for you as I believe you have both Army and CSU back to back. So I think we're looking forward to a great football season and hopefully with the COVID, uh, the progress we're making with the COVID that we'll be able to actually have those games this fall. But let me take a moment uh, up front here to emphasize the importance of this event. This conference brings together individuals from across the legal spectrum that are involved in space law in some form or fashion. Today, we have attorneys from throughout the DOD attending this event. Some have practiced in this area for many years, while others have a budding interest in space law. We are also glad to welcome our interagency partners. This really gets at one of my key tasks for US Space Command, and that is integrating commercial and interagency organizations. Additionally, we have a large number of individuals from academia attending the conference. I'm happy to see many representatives from our international partners driving home another one of my key tasks of the command, and that is maintaining key relationships. Now, yesterday I spoke to a number of budding policymakers at George Washington University Space Policy Institute. One of my biggest points for them was the importance of good foreign policy and building relationships with our allies. This conference is a venue that allows us to do just that. Many of our, many of our guests from our partner nations and allies are not only attending the conference, but are also sitting on panels to share their perspectives. I'd like to extend a special welcome to them and note how important this type of collaboration is for the space enterprise. You will hear from some other great panels and keynotes over the next three days, but I want you to remember this. It is also important to build critical relationships within this small but highly impactful community. 
It will help further our mission and ensure Americans and allies never have a day without space. You will, be, you will especially rely on these relationships because the space domain has gained momentum in the national security community over the last few years. In the United States, this happened in two ways. The first is the elevation of US Space Command as the 11th and newest combatant command. The second is the creation of the US Space Force as the US newest branch of the armed forces. This reflects the incredible importance of space to our nation. Space capability fuels, as was mentioned earlier, the American way of life. And these actions also recognize the increasing threat we face in the geopolitical environment. Some of the things you will be doing in this conference will help us better understand China and Russia and how we can compete with them within the existing legal framework. That gets a third key task for US Space Command, understanding our competition. It is our competitors that have weaponized space and the department is focused on space in response to those changes in the strategic environment. Our national security and homeland defense increasingly relies upon space. Space is a key enabler to the joint force, and it is critical that we identify the legal challenges in the space domain in order to support the joint force. U.S. Space Command and the Department of Defense have, have to comply with domestic and international law as well as U.S. policy. The work you will all do here will help us in compliance with helping to enable the command to compete and win. This is my fourth key task to the command as we encounter and address complex legal issues on a daily basis. We need to ensure our actions conform to legal and policy requirements. Attorneys that understand the applicable law and policy and who can navigate the unique issues involved in the space domain are critical to helping the command fight, win, in, from, and to space. Our nation's attorneys have addressed legal issues surrounding the space domain ever since Sputnik in 1957, if not before that. The rapid evolution of space technology led to a golden age of international law. Several treaties were signed during the 1960s and the 1970s, including the Outer Space Treaty. It laid the foundation for the international legal regime governing activity in outer space. Since then, the space domain has changed significantly. It is now undoubtedly congested, contested, and competitive. This leads to new and unique challenges, as part of it is understanding what behaviors the law does and does not address. With that in mind, we need support in our efforts to define responsible military behavior in space. When we look at the maritime and air domains, there is a long history of the development of their respective norms of behavior. Thousands of years ago, there were unwritten customs for maritime behavior between the Egyptians and Greeks. Some of the earliest maritime customs were established in 900 BC and have evolved into part of modern day maritime law. The air domain doesn't have quite as long a history, but it also took time to develop international understanding of responsible behavior. So space is obviously a newer domain and much of the legal framework developed before significant changes in activity occurred. Applying the legal framework to the increasingly complex space domain activities requires focused legal analysis and expertise. By understanding and operating within the legal, existing legal framework, we can help to ensure outer space remains open and free for America as well as our allies. In addition to the existing law, we are part of a larger effort within the US government and with our allies to advocate for responsible behavior in space. Our goal is to ensure a safe, sustainable, and stable space environment. You are part of the team who can outthink our competition to ensure U.S. Space Command maintains our advantage through well-founded space combat uh, power. So I wanna say thank you for all for being here and for helping to ensure that we are thinking beyond the atmosphere, especially when it comes to legal issues. I know this conference brings a lot of individuals together that help our space warfighters do the mission do it lawfully and do so in a way others can emulate. So I understand, uh, I think I've got my J5 that's coming up behind me, but I've got a, a few minutes if you wanna, and I'm open to a few questions if you'd like.
General Thank Dickinson, you. thank you very much for those thoughts. And I do believe we do have time for a couple questions. Um, first, space is often described as a, quote, war fighting domain. Could you please provide your perspective on that? Sure. Well, I, I would say like all other domains, it was only a matter of time before space was recognized as a war fighting domain. Uh, the space domain is only limited by the innovation, I think, of the human mind. And what most people don't understand is that space was never really a sanctuary. From the beginning of the space race, spacefaring nations have sought ways to deny each other the advantages that space capabilities provide to our way of life. The space environment is far more competitive and dangerous today than ever before. Our competitors are challenging our national security and our way of life because the importance we place as Americans on space and everything we do uh, every day in our normal lives depends upon that. So th I think the establishment of the US Space Command demonstrates that critical importance. Thank you. Um, and second, uh, there are obviously a number of challenges that US Space Command overcame over the past 18 months as a recently elevated combatant command. What are some of the challenges you see coming for the next 12 to 24 months? I think one of the biggest challenges that has come up recently and will con continue to present itself as a problem is the coordination of testing in space. Uh, in other words, uh, we, we have a lot of throughout the whole of government, not only the DOD, but the whole of government. We have a lot of folks that are, uh, if not already doing testing in space or planning to do testing in space. And currently there is no entity that really takes a comprehensive whole of government look at testing and experimentation in space. So I think this really kind of creates uh, some risk uh, that technical demonstrations and other on orbit non operational space activities could be viewed in, in the aggregate as escalatory. So I think, you know, as we move forward, is that we, we need to look very carefully at how we um, synchronize those types of activities in space, that there is a synchronizer. And I would propose to you, I think that would be US Space Command, uh, as our as my AOR is defined as, quite frankly, 100 kilometers to infinity, um, is that we are the best postured in order to do that in terms of what combatant commands do. Combatant commands do that type of uh, activity in terms of synchronizing either combat operations or operations within their geographic AOR, take UCOM, Indopaycom, CENTCOM, Nothing happens within those AORs that, uh, quite frankly, the combat command or the combatant command staff is not aware of. And so I would propose that we, we at U.S. Space Command probably have the best uh, vantage point in order to synchronize activities in space so that we make sure that we do things in a very deliberate manner that does not become escalatory at some point. And uh, in addition to that, we can also use those types of activities uh, to the advantage of the combatant command and some of the things that we're doing in terms of messaging to our allies and partners, as well as some of our competitors around the world. So I think that you know, I've got many challenges, as you can imagine, standing up a brand new combatant command, but uh, that is one of them that we're looking very closely at. Hey, General Dickinson, thank you very much for your support and for spending your valuable time to address this conference.